This is going to be verse by verse of Hebrews chapter 3. In the first two chapters, we saw how the Lord Jesus Christ was better than the angels. In chapter 3, we're going to see how Jesus Christ is greater than Moses. Moses wrote of Jesus Christ. He knew there was a prophet coming like unto him. As it says in Acts 7, 37, speaking of Jesus, this is that Moses which said unto the children of Israel, A prophet should the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren, like unto me, him shall ye hear. That prophet, the verse is speaking of, is the Lord Jesus Christ. The religious people of Jesus' day really thought highly of Moses. They believed Moses was the greatest. And when you read the Gospels, you can really see that. Because... In John 9, 29, it says, We know that God spake unto Moses. As for this fellow, we know not from whence he is. Talking about Jesus. So they thought really highly of Moses. So Paul is writing Hebrews 3 to show that Jesus is actually greater than their hero Moses. The creator is better than the creature. So Hebrews 3, 1. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. Did you know Jesus Christ is an apostle? Also, did you notice that apostle is capitalized here? It isn't capitalized for Peter or for Paul. This shows us that Jesus Christ is the greatest apostle. Apostle means Sent one. Kind of reminds you of postal. So wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. He is our high priest. Greater than the high priests of the Old Testament. Who was faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. So you see there the comparison to Moses. Jesus Christ was also faithful to him that appointed him. And Jesus Christ said himself in John 6, 38, For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. So Jesus Christ follows the lead of the Father to leave us a pattern of good works. As it says in 1 Peter 2, 21, for even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. Jesus Christ left us a pattern, because he was faithful to him that appointed him, the Father, as also Moses was faithful in all his, his house. So Moses was faithful in all his house. This is referring to the house of Israel. And Moses was faithful in giving the law. However, Moses didn't get he didn't get them into the promised land. Joshua did. And that's why Joshua is a picture of Jesus Christ who gets us eternal life. While Moses is a picture of the law. The law couldn't get you into the promised land. Jesus Christ could. John 1 17, for the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Hebrews 3.3 3. For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who hath built the house hath more honor than the house. So, obviously, Jesus Christ, the Creator, is counted more worthy than Moses, the creature. And 1 Timothy 2.5 says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. It calls him the man, Christ Jesus. That's why in Hebrews 3, 3, For this man was counted more worthy, counted worthy of more glory than Moses. Jesus Christ is fully God and fully man. Jesus Christ gets more honor than Moses because Jesus Christ built the house that Moses is a part of. The man who builds a house gets more honor than the house he built. And the house can't build itself. The universe can't build itself. Jesus Christ made it. Hebrews 3, 4. For every house is builded by some man, 
but he that built all things is God. Notice once again you have the deity of Christ out in the open for everyone to see. Paul says, he that built all things is God. And at the same time, he's referring to Jesus Christ. Colossians chapter 1. You read that, you'll see Jesus is the creator. You read John 1, you'll obviously see Jesus as the creator. Hebrews 3, 5. And Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. So the Lord speaks of Moses as as faithful over all his house. And this shows us the Lord's forgiveness. Moses sinned, and his sins are mentioned in the Bible just like everybody else. Moses had faults. He had a temper at times, and he doubted at times. But Moses was faithful in all his house. Uh, Hebrews 3, 6, But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house are we, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. So this isn't the same house of 1 Timothy 3.15, which is the house of God, the church of the living God. The house in 1 Timothy 3.15 is different. It's the church. It's the body of Christ. Once you get in this house, you were locked in, whether or not you hold fast, firm unto the end or not. But that's a different house in Hebrews 3.6. Notice the phrase, the end, in Hebrews chapter 3. And if you search the phrase, the end, then you'll notice it refers to the end of the tribulation in other places. Matthew 24, 13 and 14 says, But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. And if you know the uh, context of Matthew 24, you know it's talking about the tribulation. So the end has to do with the end of a certain time. It refers to the end of the tribulation. So, link that back with Hebrews 3, 6. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house are we, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope, firm unto the end. And me and you ain't going through the tribulation. And so we're not going to have to worry about holding anything firm unto the end of the tribulation. Now Hebrews 3, 7. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, today, if you will hear our verse 5, Hebrews 3, 5. And Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. But Christ as a son over his own house whose house are we if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing firm unto the end. So to enter into the millennial rest, the saints in the tribulation are going to have to hold fast their confidence firm unto the end. They can't worship the beast or take his mark. They'll have to die as a martyr and be resurrected at the end of, at the, end of the tribulation or endure unto the end holding fast. Hebrews 3, 7, Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith today, if you will hear his voice. One of the Lord's favorite sayings is, He that hath an ear, let him hear. The idea is to hear what he says today. Sin says, Wait until tomorrow. That's what sin says. The devil says, One more time won't hurt. Uh, go ahead and get saved today if you're not saved. Go ahead and confess your sins. Get back in fellowship if you're out of fellowship. That way you can... Hear what he's saying. He that hath an ear, let him hear. As the Holy Ghost saith, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation, in the day of temptation in the wilderness. The day of provocation is when Israel provoked the Lord to wrath in the wilderness. You see in Numbers 14.23, Surely they shall not see the land which I swear unto their fathers, Neither shall any of them that provoked me see it. Hebrews 3, 9. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works forty years. So an eleven-day journey that they went on back there in Exodus turned into forty years because Israel was too scared to take the land. The land told 
was uh, said by the Lord that it was their land. And they were afraid of the mighty men in Canaan. Deuteronomy 1-2 says there are 11 days journey from Horeb by the way of Mount Seir unto Kadesh Barnea. And it came to pass in the 40th year, in the 11th month, on the first day of the month, that Moses spake unto the children of Israel according unto all the Lord had given him in commandment unto them. So an 11 days journey went to a 40 year journey all because they didn't obey. Hebrews 3.10 Wherefore I was grieved with that generation and said they do always err in their heart and they have not known my ways. So the Lord was so grieved with that generation that he had them wander 40 years until that generation died off. So the children of Israel who were 20 years and upward never saw the land because they didn't want to work, walk in all the ways of the Lord. If you see in Numbers 32, 11 through 12, Surely none of the men that came up out of Egypt from 20 years old and upward shall see the land, which I swear unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob, because they have not wholly followed me, save Caleb the son of Jephuni, the Kenizzite, and Joshua the son of Nun, for they have wholly followed the Lord. So Caleb and Joshua are the only ones out of the pack who followed the Lord. In Hebrews 3, 11, So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. This is the rest of the promised land of Canaan. And you can tell Paul loved the book of Psalms as he's always quoting it. Here, it's Psalms 95, 7 through 11, which says, For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart, as in the provocation. And as in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my word, forty years long was I grieved with this generation, and said, It is a people that do err in their heart, and they have not known my ways, and to whom I swear in my wrath that they should not enter into my rest. So you see Paul consistently quoting the Old Testament. Hebrews 3.12 Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. So you can go back and look at the consequences that men had to face who didn't believe God could get them into the land. The people listened to what the spies said instead of believing what God had to say. When they went in there to, uh, to spy out the land of Canaan, the spies came back with a, a bad report. And it scared the people from going in. The spies discouraged the people from going in to possess the land that the Lord had already promised them. Just like people can discourage you from possessing the promised land in, in your victorious Christian life that you want to have. Hebrews 3.13 says, But exhort one another daily, while it is called the day, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. So don't just live for God on Sunday. Don't just do Christian things on Sunday. Exhort one another daily. And if you don't, you will get harder and harder in your heart. The more you sin, the more it deceives you. The more you sin, the harder you get because you think you're getting away with it. The more you sin against your conscience, the easier it will be to sin again. Do you know who has a hard heart? That would be the devil. It says in Job 41:24. His heart is as firm as a stone, yea, as hard as a piece of the nether millstone. So thousands of years of sinning against God made him that way. And Hebrews 3.14 says, For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. So if you are a born-again believer then you were made a partaker of Christ the moment you believed the gospel. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says, For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. So the moment you believed the gospel, you were put into the body of Christ, and you can't get out. You're made a partaker with him, from that moment. In Colossians 1, 12, 13 says, Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints 
in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. So we are already partakers, no matter what happens in this life. Doctrinally, this verse in Hebrews 3.14 is directed to someone in the tribulation who is enduring unto the end. Notice that phrase, the end, as we talked about before at the end of verse 14, putting you in that tribulation context there. Hebrews 3.15, while I said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. Do what's right today. Sin says, wait until tomorrow. The devil says, sin one more time. God says, get right, right now. God says don't wait until the new year. Get saved before it's too late. Get right before it's too late. Hebrews 3.16 For some when they had heard did provoke, albeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. Some, some of them, did, most of them did provoke. But there was a couple, Joshua and Caleb, that did not. Read the stories of these two, two men and pick up on the characteristics that they have. That way you'll turn out like them and not like the rest of them. They were the only ones with enough guts to go in to possess the land. Uh, Numbers 14, 6 through 9 says, And Joshua the son of Nun, and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, which were of them that searched the land, rent their clothes, and they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to search it is an exceeding good land. If the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it us, a land that floweth with milk and honey. Only rebel not ye against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bred for us. Their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. So you see how they they believe the Lord would give them the land, and they're trying to encourage everybody else to believe him that they're going to get the land. Hebrews 3.17 says, But with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? So let's... You see that story back in Numbers 14. God was there for the children of Israel. He fed them. He kept them clothed. He got them out from under Pharaoh and all their enemies. However, they still grieved him. In Numbers 14.22 because all those men which have seen my glory and my miracles, which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, and have tempted me now these ten times, and have not hearkened unto my voice. So they saw the power of God. They saw his miracles. They saw him split the Red Sea. But yet they won't trust him. Numbers fourteen twenty three. Surely they shall not see the land, which I swear unto their fathers. Neither shall any of them that provoked me see it. Numbers 14, 29. Your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness, and all that were numbered of you according to your whole number for twenty years old and upward which have murmured against me. So God had to let that whole generation die off, those who were twenty and upward at that time, who wouldn't go in to possess the land. He had to let all of them people die off and let a next generation go in to possess the land. That's why it ended up taking 40 years. He had to let that generation die off. Hebrews 3.18, And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believe not? Historically, this is the rest of Canaan, which you could read about back in Numbers 14. However, this pictures the millennial rest in the future. Hebrews 3.19, So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. So this shows us faith is what God's looking for. He loves faith so much that he even put on, in the Bible, a hall of faith in Hebrews 11. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. And you see how he was looking for faith, and the children of Israel just didn't have it. So therefore, they didn't go in to possess the land. But this has been Hebrews chapter 3.